the introduction for Nathan Schachtman is that the, a thorough knowledge of the law is perhaps rarer than it should be. So too is a thorough knowledge of statistics. Nathan Schachtman is one of the few people who has a thorough knowledge of both, and he has acquired this through a long and distinguished career in legal practice focusing on science and statistical evidentiary questions in pharmaceutical, occupational, environmental cases. He has taught, he is a public intellectual, he is the author of what really is the standard work on this, statistical evidence in products liability litigation. That's quite impressive to have the, you know, the reference author here. Um, he is speaking on the law, and it is, I think, not realized just how important a, the reproducibility crisis is in the law as distinct from the scholarly questions and the public policy regulatory questions. And I think if, any, if we can take away at least one thing to open up, that there are so many different areas of American life where the reproducibility crisis matters, the, and the law is a really important one of them. Um, thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon. Um, the law is really an empty vessel when it comes to science and, and most other things. It, gets its information about science from expert witnesses who come into court and hold forth on a, with their opinions. Um, the basic unit is testimony, not scientific studies. So it's actually very unusual for a scientific study itself to be admissible in evidence. It, it is an expert witness on the stand who gives an opinion, typically a causal conclusion, which if he's pressed, he'll have to disclose the bases for. And then he'll say, well, I, I've looked at these studies um, and I'm relying on those. And those studies warrant my inference to the conclusion. Well, uh, 26 and a half years ago, the Supreme Court of the United States put a stop to expert witnesses coming to court and just giving opinions without adequate bases. In an opinion, Daubert against Merrill uh, Dow Pharmaceuticals, it was a Bendectin birth defects case, and basically the holding of the case was that the Fry standard was no longer the law in federal court, but in dictum, uh, in an opinion by the late Justice Blackmun, uh, the court articulated several uh, factors to be considered. None of them are uh, necessary. Uh, they are not an exclusive list of factors, but the court articulated the need for tested and, and testable uh, evidence for published and peer-reviewed uh, studies, uh, measurable and acceptable rates of error. They didn't really specify what they meant by that. And uh, the old general acceptance standard in the scientific community was carried forward into the, the Daubert standard itself, and on remand, uh, former Judge Kaczynski in the Ninth Circuit uh, added uh, that we should be looking at how much of this opinion and the underlying basis is litigation driven. Well, there was a succession of three additional Supreme Court cases uh, ultimately resulting in a unanimous court in the last one, and it ended up uh, with uh, an adoption of Rule 702 as modified. This is a statute, so it supersedes all the prior case law, which was not constitutional, but rather just uh, common law. And uh, today, the, uh, the, the rule mandated by Congress is that a qualified expert may testify if, and, and that's the language of the rule, but I will suggest to you they meant if and only if, that's why I have IFF there, uh, these four conditions are met. And let me just say as an aside, I know not everybody can see the slides uh, well. Um, I will make sure that if you email me or David Randall, uh, you'll get a copy of the slides. Anyway, these four uh, are conditions that are uh, jointly necessary are, are really very interesting and very telling. The Supreme Court, uh, now speaking through Congress and, and Rule 702, requires that the experts' uh, scientific opinion has to be knowledge. And for me, having wasted the flower of my youth studying epistemology, that means an epistemic warrant, all right? That doesn't mean a hunch or speculation. 
and it will help the trier of fact to understand an, uh, an issue in evidence uh, and the like. Uh, the second is that the testimony is based on sufficient facts and data. Well, that, that's really interesting because before judges were told sufficiency questions are for the jury and you just decide whether the methodology is appropriate, but now courts will have to look at whether um, a study might be too small and unprobative to even support the epistemic warrant for knowledge. C, uh, the testimony is the product of reliable principles and methods, and here you should understand that the word reliable really has the gloss of valid, and the court and subsequent decisions have made that really clear. And fourth and last, the expert has reliably applied the principles and methods to the facts of the case. There's an there's a adjunctive rule, Rule 703, which deals with uh, the things that experts rely on. Now, epidemiologic studies, and I do mostly health effects litigation, epidemiologic studies contain about eight levels of hearsay. You have a patient who gives information to a physician who puts it in a chart. It's then coded by somebody to an ICD code, then the coder, then uh, somebody else picks up the codes and enters it into a statistical program, somebody else analyzes it, then somebody else analyzes the analysis, and then it goes into maybe a draft, and, and then other people come aboard, and, uh, and the, meanwhile the data is being cleaned, and, and, and all sorts of things are happening to the data. So there are about seven steps of separation between you know, the personal knowledge of the person who gave the information to the published paper. So most of the time, published papers are not going to be admissible. It is the opinion of the expert that brings it into court. And this rule says that it doesn't have to be admissible. The expert on the witness stand can rely on things that themselves are not admissible if they are of a type reasonably relied upon by experts in that field. So that brings me to the first case study. I'm going to talk about two litigations and three studies. And I think that these case studies are generalizable, and I think they tell us something about the importance of how uh, these kinds of conflicts get resolved and the importance of access to underlying information. I'm going to start with litigation that I was involved in, and I should say that none of my opinions are uh, my clients, but they should be, and that um, this litigation uh, involved GlaxoSmithKline's Avandia, or rosiglitazone. Uh, Avandia uh, the new drug application was submitted in 1998. It was one of the largest clinical trial uh, submissions ever, uh, 21 separate clinical trials, uh, several thousand patients. And um, the Avandia debacle really got started with another litigation involving Glaxo, the, the Paxil litigation, or paroxetine, which is an antidepressant. Uh, Elliot Spitzer, who was at that time the uh, state's attorney general in New York, in my neighborhood, he's known as client number nine, um, <laughs> sued Glaxo over a clinical trial involving paroxetine. And Glaxo settled that lawsuit um, for two and a half million dollars. It was not a, a big settlement, but part of the agreement was to post online the underlying data for all their clinical trials. And now Avandia was approved in November 1999, and the Avandia clinical trial safety data went online at the Glaxo website. Fast forward to June 2007, uh, the picture is Steve Nissen, uh, at the time the director of the Cleveland Clinic, um, and a very ambitious fellow, published uh, a meta-analysis of the safety data from all the clinical trials that were posted online and some others uh, on rosiglitazone and cardiovascular outcomes, mostly heart attack and stroke. And um, this was a, a lead off, uh, article in the New England Journal of Medicine. It made quite a media splash. Um, it was a meta-analysis, as I meant. And the question is, is it a meta-analysis or a schmeta analysis That's a New York question. Um, and keep in mind that this manuscript from Dr. Nissen was submitted to the New England Journal on May 1st, 2007. It was actually accepted within a week so much for peer review, Pub published online May 21st, 2007. The first lawsuit came in the door at Glaxo within a day or two of the publication online. Now, it was a pretty damning 
study at face value, and the FDA reacted appropriately and called for a meeting of an advisory committee that, that convened uh, September of 2007. And shortly thereafter, the FDA uh, required a boxed warning and imposed a risk evaluation management strategy on Glaxo, which made the use of the drug in the United States virtually impossible. You couldn't start any new patients. You could only continue old patients. You had to give them, an, you had to get an informed consent, and so on and so forth. So let me talk a little bit about Nissen's meta-analysis. Uh, he screened 116 studies, and only 48 met his inclusion uh, and survived his exclusion criteria. Uh, 10 of those studies, of the 48, had zero heart attack events, and you'll hear more about that. Now, he used a method uh, developed by Sir Richard Pito called the Pito uh, meta-analysis method, uh, which generates an odds ratio. Uh, he came up with a, a summary estimate of risk of 1.43. That's an odds ratio. That's a 43% increase. It was statistically significant um, uh, at the 5% level. Nissen's data set was transparent and accessible to all. He didn't do anything impermissible except that nobody could get his result statistically significant except by using the pedo method. There were about a dozen do-over publications, and each one took a different approach, and you know, as, as I'll discuss, but none of them were able to find a statistically significant increase. And the Nissen meta-analysis provoked this really robust debate because it raised some really difficult and interesting methodological issues. Um, in the courtroom, we were just suffering, but in, in the scientific world, scientists actually found this interesting. Um, first of all, the events were rare. We're talking about heart attacks in a clinical trial, six months, 12 months. It's not a common uh, event. It, the data were sparse. There were a lot of clinical trials where there were no heart attacks in either the experimental arm or the placebo arm of the trial, or they might have been zero and one or one and zero. And so that raised questions about the validity of the asymptotic inference, which is typically an, a, an assumption of a method such as PEDOS, and it raised the question whether an exact method of inference, uh, like an exact binomial, should have been used. There was a question about the choice of how we measure the association. Should we use a risk ratio where you're simply dividing the rate in the exposed by the rate in the unexposed, or should we use a measure of the risk, risk difference, which would better capture uh, the zero, zero trials where the risk difference would be zero, and we could measure the variance around zero. And then there was the question of fixed versus random effects. Fixed effect models look at a single parameter. Uh, random effects models assume that we're looking at an average of multiple effects. And if you think about it, just for a moment, uh, the clinical trials involved two, four, and eight milligrams of Avandia. They involved old patients, young patients, patients with prediabetes, and patients with diabetes. They involved patients that didn't even have diabetes, had Alzheimer's disease. There was no pretense that we were estimating a single parameter. So uh, a fixed effect model was clearly inappropriate. Um, so did the exclusion of zero event trials bias Nissen's study? Uh, Friedrich and his uh, colleagues in 2007, later in the year, published an article saying the exclusion of zero total event trials from meta-analyses increases the effect size compared to those meta-analyses that include these trials. And they concluded zero event trials provide relevant data by showing that the event rates for both the intervention and control groups are low and equal, relatively equal. I mean, they are actually equal, but uh, we, we assume some variance. So here is uh, Nissen's meta-analysis. And what uh, is done here is you see a forest plot. The vertical line represents uh, the odds ratio of one, the log odds of which is zero. And you see from the study showing some uh, association below one, suggesting a protective benefit, to those studies at the bottom with an elevation. The little dots represent the point estimates, the actual odds ratio for each clinical trial. And then the bar at the bottom represents the summary estimate of risk 
gotten to by the pedo meta analysis. So the pedo meta, pedo meta analysis found a 43% increased risk. Uh, the p-value was 3%. And the question marks in the middle represent the 0, zero clinical trials. And the question is, uh, what is the story about nothing? Uh, in math, we know zeros are not nothing. They are a number and they have an importance, but they're not included in PETO's method. So that brings me to uh, Len Gen, uh, Lee Jen Wei's meta-analysis. Uh, LJ, as his friends know him, um, published next year, 2008, a risk difference meta-analysis. And uh, LJ accepted Friedrich's uh, conclusion that um, zero, zero event trials had important information. And he did a risk difference meta-analysis using binomial technique rather than an asymptotic technique. And uh, so what you see here is you see the zero, zero trials now filled in. The, 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 the dots represent the point estimates in terms of risk difference. Okay, not a risk ratio anymore. And LJ found a small risk difference of 0.18%, but he found a p-value of 27% as opposed to 3%. So basically an order of magnitude higher than what Nissen had found. If Nissen had this meta-analysis, he could not have gotten it published in the New England Journal of Medicine. But I, I want to make a point that all these contrary and alternative uh, meta-analyses took Nissen's data set as a starting point. They were readily available, and they worked from that. And they were all hashed out in the scientific community. And I think it says something about uh, the importance of availability of underlying data. So a paper published again in 2008 by various authors, Hernandez and others, including John Ioannidis, uh, concluded that, yeah, methodology really matters. And they said, as the rosiglitazone of Andia case demonstrates, minor modifications of the meta-analysis protocol can change the statistical significance of the result. For small effects, even the direction of the treatment effect estimate may change. Well, while all that was going on, uh, we were in the courtroom and we filed Daubert challenges, Rule 702 challenges to expert witnesses who were going to rely primarily on the Nissen meta-analysis. And, you know, we hashed all this out and the judge looked at us and said, tell it to the jury. <laughs> um, denied our uh, motions and uh, set cases for trial. And while that was happening, uh, there was a, a large trial going on called the Record Trial. It was finally published in late 2009. Um, and so while we were litigating, the FDA had its heightened warnings and its REMS, Risk Evaluation Management Strategy, in place. Um, but when record became available, we had a long-term cardiovascular outcome randomized trial in over 4,400 patients, followed an average of over five years. And it was a non-inferiority trial for technical reasons. You can't really do a trial to look for harms, right? But uh, this had safety outcome as a secondary uh, outcome, but it was looking uh, to see whether they could rule out a 20% increased risk uh, when compared with standard of care diabetes treatment, which frequently would involve insulin. Uh, the study met its primary objective. The uh, ratio of um, in, in the uh, exposed to the control of cardiovascular death or hospitalization was 0 0.99, about as close as you get to one uh, on the good side, uh, a little bit below one. And, uh, and you can see from the upper bound of the confidence interval, uh, it, uh, it ruled out the 20%, which was pre-specified. So the FDA acted appropriately. They removed the REMS for Avandia. They removed the, uh, some of the warning language. Um, this was in December 2015, but the jest was over. Uh, in April 2012, Van, uh, Rosie, I'm sorry, Glaxo lost its patent protection on, on Avandia, and by uh, 2015, it had spent $6.4 billion in defending the litigation and settling the cases. So I, I want to move to another litigation and talk about two studies involved, and I have the 
pleasure of having with me Dr. Jinlin Song, who helped me uh, litigate the, uh, this study that I have up here on the slide, uh, prevalence of Parkinsonism and relationship of, to exposure in a large sample of Alabama welders. This was, quite frankly, a, a crummy little cross-sectional study, um, but in the courtroom, when things get hyped and waved around, they take on a much bigger presence. And uh, this was done by a group of neurologists at St. Louis, uh, Washington University, St. Louis. Um, good school, and Reset seemed like an honest uh, character. Uh, although our antennae went up when we saw at the bottom of the, the first page of the article that um, it was supported by an NIH grant and also the Welder Health Fund. And we, we did a little digging. Turned out the Welder Health Fund was really the, the plaintiff's lawyers down in Mississippi, Alabama. And um, Reset swore that he didn't take any money personally, but it seemed like a lot of money went to his department, paid for things like pencils and paper, and you know, but not to him personally. Uh, he always insisted on that, so I'll, I'll repeat that. Um, and let, let us say we were skeptical about this paper, and we thought that a subpoena might be in order in order to uh, get at the underlying data, see what was really going on. The study found a tenfold uh, increase in prevalence, because it was a cross-sectional study, and, um, uh, you know, tenfold risk, if that's real, would be something to talk about in a courtroom, and so we were, frankly, a little concerned about this study. Um, so we compelled Dr. Reset by subpoena to produce his underlying data. Well, all hell broke loose then. Um, I, here you can see Dr. Reset's data and the many misclassifications. Oh, no, you can't see. I'm sorry, you can't see Dr. Reset's data because you haven't signed the uh, protective order affidavit, the non-disclosure affidavit that the court required. But I can talk to you a little bit about the data. Uh, we did find many misclassifications and many mistakes, and we, we showed our expert witnesses these, the underlying data. They prepared supplemental reports, which were filed under seal, and what happened was that Dr. Reset's re uh, study was never mentioned again in the welding litigation. Uh, it just became a, like a balloon that burst and went away, but Dr. Reset was not going to let it go. Um, he wrote a very uh, biting editorial in the journal Neurology, calling me out for having uh, had uh, for having subpoenaed him, and told me that it was totally inappropriate, and he really dressed me down. And I wrote a, admittedly a somewhat snarky letter to the editor in reply, which got published. And um, <laughs> the upshot is that the other NAS, the National Academies of Science. Uh, invited us to come to Washington to debate the issue of access to underlying data. And it was really quite a, a fun thing uh, to go to Washington to do this. Uh, and, and Reset gave his pitch and how, how disruptive this was. I got up and I said, well, you know, the court made us pay you for your time and we paid over $100,000 to get the access, access to the underlying data. And, uh, and besides which, you're from St. Louis show me the data, <laughs> you know, you're from the show me state. And um, at the end of the day, the, uh, the committee decided that they didn't really need to take a position on this little contest, uh, and they just let it slip away into the annals of the law and medicine. And that was really the end of that study. Um, the next study I want to talk about is one that was done by the National Center, uh, well, it was, it used data from the National Center for Health Statistics, but it was done by researchers at CDC NIOSH, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. Uh, Robert Park was the lead author, and it was published in the, uh, the what I call the Red Journal, the American Journal of Industrial Medicine. Um, the, the fact that it's got a red cover is neither here nor there. Um, but um, what, what Park and his colleagues did was they looked uh, at this NCHS data set, which is really death certificate information. It's really very low quality information. It, it looks at occupation on death certificates and causes of death. And they looked at 87 occupations where there was some suggestion there might be uh, a risk of neurodegenerative disease. 
Uh, they looked at four different neurodegenerative diseases in two sexes. There were only two sexes back then. And uh, two age strata, all right? So a lot of comparisons. Um, and, you know, they found some things that actually had been found previously, like that there was an increased risk for biomedical scientists, um, greater than twofold, uh, in clergy, religious workers, college teachers, and social workers. But that was not really the focus of Park's article. Park had been working with the plaintiff's lawyers. Um, that was undisclosed at the time, but became obvious. And um, what he really wanted to uh, put forward was this analysis for welding tradesmen. The, the issue in this litigation was that welding fume with manganese in the welding fume caused Parkinson's disease or secondary Parkinsonism from a, a toxic encephalopathy. And um, so Park here presents all four of the neurodegenerative diseases of interest. And I have circled the Parkinson's disease data. And you can see that he had 540 cases greater than 65. And the odds ratio for Parkinson's disease was 0 0.87, below 1. So in other words, in a protective direction. And it was actually statistically significantly, forgetting about the lack of uh, the multiple comparisons, below one. And he only had 20, which he said were um, under age 65. Parkinson's disease mortality is something that typically does not happen in young people. But there are aggressive cases early onset where people die uh, earlier. And uh, there he reported out a 1.77 77% uh, increased risk, uh, and it was statistically significant. And what you, you can't see, and even if you could see it, you probably wouldn't understand, and I'm not, being, uh, I'm not disparaging your abilities, because none of the experts in the case understood the following language, which I've pulled out of the legend. Um, and I won't go through it, because it's, it's pretty tedious, but I will point out that what I have in red is that MOR, mortality odds ratio, age under 65 is estimate of enhanced risk, age under 65 versus age 65. Now, that's not what he was supposed to be doing. He was supposed to be comparing the mortality of Parkinson's disease in welders under age 65 with the mortality in non-welders under age 65. But what he did is he did this internal comparison of rates saying, well, the, the younger uh, welders under age 65, and that seems young now, uh, were dying at a higher rate, or at least as recorded on death certificate. Now, when you go through the article, you'll see that every time he does this very dubious analysis, he comes up with a statistically significant elevation. For every, every time he does it, it, it's elevated. I think it's simply a reporting uh, bias that young people tend to have, if they have Parkinson's disease, it gets on their death certificate. If they're young, if they're 85 years old and in a nursing home and they die, it's just cardiopulmonary arrest. But, you know, I couldn't prove that. So what I did was, uh, well, uh, let me just say a few things about Park's language in his paper. Um, even though he had done over a thousand comparisons uh, even though he did an analysis that was quite non-standard, uh, he used his analysis to conclude, quote, the observation here that PD, Parkinson's disease mortality, is elevated among workers with likely manganese exposure from welding below age 65, based on 20 deaths, supports the welding Parkinsonism connection. Now, I don't know what a connection is. I know what a correlation is. I know what an association is. I know what a statistically significant association is if you specify the p-value. But I don't know what a connection is. That's journalese. And, uh, but it was being used to good effect in the courtroom. And so the plaintiff's testifying experts were basically relying on language such as this. Of the four neurodegenerative diseases under study, only Parkinson's disease was associated with occupations where arc welding of steel is performed and only for the 20 PD deaths below age 65. Um, and I thought that, that was a gross misrepresentation of what the data showed. I actually, the NCHS data are actually freely available on the University of Michigan website. You can go to it and download it. And you can do all these analysis, and I had already done some. 
And, uh, but I couldn't publish the paper. So I took a DVD of the data and I got on the Acela and I went up uh, to Harvard and uh, I, I knocked on Mayor Stamford's door and I said, Mayor, look at this paper. <laughs> He's got 87 occupations, four diseases, two sexes, two age strata. He's talking about con connection. Nobody understands this comparison age, under age 65 versus over age 65. Haven't we reached the least publishable unit <laughs> Isn't this worthy of you to publish? Uh, and he said, well, I'll take a look at the data. And he did publish uh, the next year a paper uh, that was essentially a reanalysis of Park's data set. And it wasn't Park's data set. It freely available in the public domain, and uh, anybody could have at it. Now, you're not going to be able to see this slide because the print is small and I, I, I should have laid it out differently. But on this slide, you see the primary outcome in, an a, in a properly age-adjusted odds ratio calculation for welders defined two different ways depending how broad you wanted to capture welding exposure, uh, where the adjusted odds ratio was either 0 0.88 or 0 0.86, both of which had nominal confidence intervals, 95% confidence intervals, where the upper bound was below one. But I wanted Mayer to do a age, age analysis for young uh, welders, and he did that. He had to break the data set up into two because the coding changed from uh, ICD-8 to 9. And uh, what he found was that for welders under age 65, the um, the odds ratio was 0 0.99 for the first group of years, 1985 to 1991. And then in the second set of years, 1992 to 1999, it was a little bit elevated, 1.44, but not even close to statistical significance. And it was, you know, so what happened was that there was a little bit of a bump one year. But, you know, in those 11 cases, basically what we were seeing is one or two deaths every year. In one year, we had two. And that was the granularity of the result, which he was able to show. Well, uh, fast forward yet another year, 2000, well, a few years, 2012, Jim Mortimer and Laureen Nelson, uh, both uh, neuroepidemiologists, did a meta-analysis of welding exposure or manganese exposure and Parkinson's disease. Again, the dotted line, the vertical line, is the line of no association. The little rectangles represent the point estimates. Um, you notice how most of them are to the left of the dotted line, suggesting a reduced risk for welders and uh, Parkinson's. And the horizontal lines represent the confidence intervals or the, the standard error. And uh, you can see the, these studies are ordered in uh, increasing variance, so the most precise studies are up at top. And you'll see at the bottom a diamond, and that's the traditional way in a meta-analysis we give the summary uh, odds ratio or the summary estimate of risk. And uh, here it was uh, 0 0.86, again, under 1 in a protective direction and nominally statistically significant with an upper bound of a 95% confidence interval of 0.92. So um, in science, as in politics and law, falsehood flies and the truth comes limping after. Um, the judge in the, um, in the uh, welding fume cases uh, basically denied our motions, sent the cases to the jury. We tried 24 cases. We won 20. Uh, had one reversal. The four losses, one was reversed on appeal. One was pending when we did a global settlement for, I can't say, but a very small amount of money and uh, we paid two judgments. So discussion. Uh, historically, science has had no val validity criteria which the law was bound to respect. It's sort of the Dred Scott principle uh, transferred to the world of scientific litigation. Uh, fraud does remain prevalent, and I've seen it in several of litigations I've been involved in. But the Daubert and Rule 702 standards do help. Um, not in the cases I've discussed with you today, but um, the problem is really it's uneven. Uh, I get some very good judges and I get some very boneheaded judges uh, who just say this is a jury question because I don't understand it. 
And it might go better uh, if we had qualified judges. In New York County, we have a commercial division. So if a contract case you know, is over a certain amount of money, you get a specialized judge, right? But if you have a case involving uh, complex health effects uh, studies, you get your ordinary judge and your ordinary jury. And I think that it could be improved by referrals to the national academies, to uh, expert, uh, court-appointed expert witnesses. There are techniques that could improve uh, the gatekeeping. My wish list, trust but verify. I, if I see a study and it's again me, I want to see dated protocols. I want to see statistical analysis plans. I want to see all amendments to the plans. I want to see your programming inputs and outputs. And I want to see your graphical outputs too. And I want to see them all. And if, they, and if some of them you know, aren't there, I want to know why. Um, I think we should hold scientists to evolving standards of care. There are many uh, standards papers um, on how to do systematic reviews and meta-analyses, consort, prisma, moose. You're going to hear much about the American Statistical Association 2016 statement, and I think that we need closer adherence to that both in uh, publications and in the courtroom. And then um, I think we can improve post-publication peer review. There's a thing called P pub peer where you can go online and, and actually write a, a very significant comment about a paper. And I've done that about Park's paper. Um, he's never responded. Uh, but I think it would be great if we would have publication of more negative studies like uh, L.J. Way's uh, risk difference meta-analysis. And finally, I think that we should treat positional conflicts just as seriously as we treat financial conflicts of interest. And by positional conflicts, I mean scientists, like every other human being, become wedded to their hypotheses. And they have a vested interest in seeing those hypotheses uh, established and contrary ones defeated. Um, and that conflict and that motivation can be just as strong, if not stronger, than all the money in the world. Thank you. I will be happy to answer questions now or later or whenever. Oh, oh I, so uh, I've done peer reviews uh, I, I, for engineering journals. Uh, it, when, when papers are used in a legal context, is there some kind of standard for a peer review? Because when I did peer reviews, there was no standard at all. No one. Yeah, well, the, as you probably know, the, the quality uh, and quantity of peer review varies from journal to journal, and sometimes it's not knowable what the nature of the peer review is. For journals like the New England Journal of Medicine, um, there's a little bit more information, and I've certainly I've had experts who have done peer reviews, so I could draw on them. But, you know, even there it's a variable, as you can see from Nissen's meta-analysis. It got virtually no peer review. And... Um, you know, and that is at the premier clinical medical journal in the United States. So um, litigants tend to wave around a study and say, look, it's a peer-reviewed journal because it says that in the masthead or something like that. But nobody knows what that means, and it usually means very little. Yes, Dr. Song. Uh, Nathan, um, and for the room of scientists, I was the uh, attorney who helped Nathan digest dissect the underlying data of one of the uh, one of his cases. So I have my question is from a, an attorney point of view. Have you ever tried to explain all these concepts to a group of jury and how did that go? I have and it, it, it's I, I got to tell you it's a very daunting task. Um, I, I actually had a, a jury in Middlesex County, New Jersey, which has a large South Asian population. 
Um, and, and many of them are engineers and um, uh, pharmacists and technicians, and it, it went beautifully. I tried a catastrophic stroke case um, involving phenylpropanolamine um, back in 2002, and uh, I had a pharmacist at Robert Wood Johnson Hospital. I had a, an engineer, and uh, the uh, uh, the engineer actually asked a question. Jurors were allowed to ask questions, and he, he asked one of the plaintiff's experts, you said something was statistically significant, but the p-value was exactly 5%. p equals 5%. I thought it was supposed to be less than 5%. The, the expert totally flubbed the question, because if you have a normal distribution, there is no difference between something that is 5% or less than 5%. And his answer revealed a, 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 a terrible lack of knowledge of statistics. But, um, but that's the level of sophistication I've encountered in, in some courtrooms, and then in other courtrooms, uh, you know, it's crickets.